Hello and welcome to this video presentation on BIM and the QS from Duncan Cartledge Online. On completion of this video, you will understand the drivers for BIM adoption in the construction industry and understand the uses, potential and threats of BIM. When it was first announced that BIM would be mandated for public sector projects, once again, many voices predicted it would herald the demise of the quantity surveyor, as one of BIM's many attributes is the ability to produce quantities. For a number of reasons, as discussed later in this video, this has not proved to be the case. The first question is, why BIM? Well, it's all part of the UK government's drive for value for money. For years, the perception has been that the UK construction industry has been delivering poor value for money. If you are a politician, then the prospects of introducing a system like BIM that promises to deliver infrastructure projects on time and to cost is very appealing. Therefore, the government's 2011 construction strategy included a requirement that BIM at level two, the levels of BIM will be explained later, should be mandatory for all centrally procured projects. It was hoped that the private sector would follow. The EU public procurement juggernaut followed in 2018. Next question, what exactly is BIM? First and foremost, BIM is a tool to foster collaboration, a fact that is often underreported in an industry renowned for its silo working and lack of transparency. In addition, BIM can produce a virtual representation of a proposed project in the form of 3D models, to which details of materials, life cycle considerations, etc. can be added. Importantly, BIM is part of the drive towards digital construction. Unlike conventional approaches, BIM makes the model the heart of the procurement process. Like most systems, BIM has its own terminology, some of which are listed here. So let's have a look at some of these terms associated with BIM. As can be seen, a lot of the terms and tools relate to establish meaningful collaboration between all parties using common data and common goals. And that really is the essence of BIM, collaboration. Difficult to achieve in an industry that traditionally has had silo-based approach and a structure where 95% of contractors are medium or small. Many of the processes are linked to the RIBA Plan of Work 2020 to ensure information is transferred effectively from stage to stage. Common data environment. Information relating to the project and the BIM model must be stored in a way that all participants can access. The common data environment facilitates easy access and is not just limited to assets created in the BIM environment. And it will therefore include documentation, graphical models and non-graphical assets. Employers information requirements. The 2020 version of the RIBA plan of work includes an information exchange taskbar at the foot of the plan. The idea being that the information produced at the end of a the stage then influences the decisions and work required during the next stage. A typical employer's information requirement in BIM will be divided into three areas, covering technical, management and commercial aspects. Construction Operations Building Information Exchange, or COBE for short, is a standardized data format required as part of BIM Level 2. 
Kobe provides details on spatial locations of the components and equipment of the project. The major aim of Kobe information is to highlight the equipment location and how the equipment is maintained. Kobe data can be exported from the BIM authoring software to facilities management software. It is open access and takes the form of a series of worksheets completed for each project. The worksheets divide the assets into manageable chunks and help the gradual correlation of information during the different stages of the project. The idea of a digital twin is to provide a digital model of a physical asset for the life of the asset that enables the facilities management requirements to be monitored. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with and use cloud-based storage on a daily basis. It has a large part to play in storing BIM data. As touched on earlier, BIM is divided into levels, 0 to 6 the levels being an indication of the level of functionality. So, let's have a look at them. At the bottom of the pile are BIM levels 0 and 1, and, as shown here, these levels deliver no collaboration, back to silo working, or level 1 delivering very basic collaboration platforms, more a way of distributing information in real time. BIM Level 2 is an important step up and reflects the true nature of BIM, collaboration. Level 3 generates a geometric model which can be used to detect design clashes, one of the most important ways to avoid costly and expensive reworking. BIM Level 4 allows for time to be introduced into the model to track site progress. Although BIM levels are available up to BIM level 6, level 5 is the top level used by most contractors, and it introduces the facilities shown on this page. So, what sort of relationship does the construction industry currently have with BIM? For sure, the rollout of BIM was very poorly handled by the Cabinet Office. Construction has always been notoriously difficult to pick up new ideas, and BIM was no different. The mandate that BIM Level 2 was to be used for all centrally procured projects from 2016 was either ignored or circumvented. The main emphasis was on expensive software and upskilling, whereas, as has been repeated many times, BIM equals collaboration. Given the lack of enthusiasm, what is the scale of adoption by the UK construction industry and how much of a threat is BIM to the future of the QS? The adoption rate is monitored by organisations such as NBS and the RICS and the outcomes of a number of surveys can be reviewed in open access reports. The crucial word is adoption as many organisations use a form of BIM but not the entire package. As far as BIM confining the QS to the scrap heap is concerned, continue to watch. This page is taken from an RICS survey on the use of BIM. It illustrates quite clearly that the number of organisations using BIM for all projects is low and it appears to have stalled when compared with previous years. In an industry that is still wedded to bottom-line capital costs, it can come as no surprise that cost heads the list of blockers to BIM adoption. After all, somebody must pay for the BIM model. There are also issues with compatibility of information, formats and skill shortages. If taking off quantities is put into Google, 
two sets of results will appear, quantity takeoffs and taking off quantities. The devil is in the detail as outlined on this page. So, is BIM a threat to the QS? Another page of the RICS report illustrates large differences in the BIM model being used to generate quantities according to country. It is apparent in countries where the QS is not an independent professional, BIM is used for takeoffs, whereas in the UK and Ireland there is much less reliance on quantities generated by BIM and a greater reliance on taking off quantities as illustrated on the next page. So what can BIM deliver? Is it the silver bullies Mini predicted a few years ago? I am, like many QSs, no Luddite, which is why the profession continues to prosper and evolve. BIM is a great asset to the project team, helping to foster collaboration and class detection, as listed here. It can also be used during a project's life cycle as a valuable facilities management tool. However, its limitations should be recognised. Is BIM a threat to the QS? My personal opinion is no. Much of the BIM output needs to be interpreted and the QS is in an ideal situation to do this. Just as in the past, the QS has interpreted drawings. Quantity takeoffs have their place, but cannot replace the bill of quantities for tendering purposes. Now, a few self-assessment questions to finish. I hope that you have found this video tutorial useful. Duncan Cartridge Online contains more than 100 video tutorials on a wide range of topics. Finally, some useful links.